This is chapter six of the marriage and family course, looking at sexuality. Most of this material is coming out of the textbook for the course. So obviously reading the textbook will give you a fuller view of the lecture as far as, as well as preparing for the test. The uh, society is constructed with uh, how we behave and interact socially, but we've also got some inherent things that we'll be looking at. Norms evolve over time as far as how uh, what's appropriate for sexual behavior in society. The norms, of course, over time, as we moved into a uh, complex civilized society that needed to be more organized, the norms start to favor those uh, with uh, having sex with people that are not related to you, of course, of the similar age. So, you know, as far as uh, you know, other aspects of what we do in society, we tend to deal with people that are somewhat similar to us as far as identity groups and uh, age groups. So the same thing is kind of happening right here. But there are still some stigmatized behaviors in society. Now, again, we'll, we'll talk more about same-sex relationships, uh, same-sex marriage, that sort of thing, masturbation. Those, These are things that are still not as socially acceptable, but they are changing over time with uh, knowledge and awareness and or perhaps even just more flat out being more open about the things even in our uh, entertainment media and stuff like that. The, uh, but the, the norms for society, there are preferred sexual acts uh, with the appropriate ages in the proper places with a certain amount of privacy and discretion. So those are things that have evolved over time in a more um, civilized, organized society. And obviously, there's, there's many reasons. The main of reasons why we have sex, of course, is to uh, reproduce and uh, continue the species. So that's why there's a very strong inherent uh, physiological function for it. One thing that I've talked about before is in our human universals is the incest taboo that we do not you know, have sex with our uh, nuclear family members. Now, of course, over many, many hundreds and hundreds of generations of over over time because of the clannishness and the the groupishness of human beings and particularly as we were starting out there was a lot of uh marriages between and relationships between first cousins uh, pretty much out of necessity but over time the keeping the the sexual relationships out of the immediate family has become one of those human universals that all societies have established over time more on the uh, the gender identity and the sexual scripts for sexuality. The clearly, it's it's as you come into adolescence, this when it becomes the uh, the most powerful driving force. Uh, particularly if for men to be the, the initiators, there's the uh, the concept of the conquest and the performance expectations, the peer pressures. Those are strong on the men's side. Women. In general, of course, we're talking about generalities here. Women focus on feelings as, as far as the uh, the sexual innocence. I guess that might have been how the system was designed, that men would be uh, the pursuers and the women would be the ones putting on the brakes, that sort of thing. Uh, there, uh, you know, We've talked about those primary differences several times before, uh, even the uh, inherent genetic differences. So there might be something going on there to uh to regulate that behavior the uh so the the generalization the male aggressive female passive you know again that that's almost to the point where it could be a uh, stereotyped but uh, the the tendencies are still there partly through socialization and partly through our inherent genetic behaviors now the scripts have been changing I, as with everything else in this class, we see particularly since the uh, 60s and 70s, there's been lots of shifts and changes and norms have been uh, revising. And uh, prior to that period, 
sexual expression was was somewhat taboo. Kind of kept that in the bedroom, private. The uh, now it's becoming uh, more of a positive connotation as a mutual exchange of pleasure, and either partner being uh, perhaps the initiator. The non-maritable sex has become quite a bit more acceptable over the years because I can remember when I was a kid that it was kind of somewhat of a norm is that you did not have sex before marriage even though a lot of people did it was still considered unacceptable to do that and then there was debates even as I was getting older there was debates about you know ooh premarital sex what do you how do you think about what do you believe as far as premarital you know things like that and now it's it's just so uh, so much accepted and also with same sex relationships that has changed dramatically because as recently as the late 80s there was a very large majority of Americans that were opposed to same sex marriage and now it's uh, a fairly substantial majority of Americans that are okay with that. Those, one of those other trends that has happened over the years of changes. Now these double standards remain where women are held to higher uh, standards than men are when it comes to these types of things. When women are sexual, they're considered more promiscuous, whereas the male, it's considered somewhat uh, of a status thing. And female sexuality, particularly in male-dominated societies, and this we've already talked about some examples on this, is that in even more male-dominated societies, they kind of go out of their way to suppress female sexuality. In the Western societies, not as much, but still some of that remains. Now, as far as learning about sex, the, uh, the parents... Uh, generally are kind of silent on this and they are left to reacting to what a child might say or do but they there is guidance provided and of course concerns if there's some situations going on there with respect to sex with the uh, adolescent teenager and curiosity and and uh, wanting to know about it the the studies in this seem to come down on the consensus that early clear communication with parents is associated with lower levels of teen sexual activity. So the more that the parents are able to share with the children as far as the, uh, wh whether it's the concerns or the, the uh, thinking about it in a healthy way, the use of safe sex practices, things like that, the more those things are discussed, then the more uh, associations you have with uh, that behavior uh, as far as teen sexual activity being a little bit more moderated, a little bit safer. So the parental monitoring is inversely associated both with adolescents becoming sexual active and the total number of sexual partners the teens have. This coming from the book here from one of the studies so that parental monitoring does matter as far as uh, affecting these types of behaviors among teens. Now, the another fairly strong norm, of course, is the assumption that uh, all children are going to be heterosexual. And that's part of what continues with the stigma of uh, same-sex relationships. But because of that assumption that there could be an avoidance of communication if there are some questions as far as that goes. The peers tend to have a pretty major influence on our sexuality or our, our learning and knowledge of sexuality because of the silence of the parents in general and then the kids go out and learn it from the, from the kid on the street who seems to know everything. But of course that is a major source of misinformation as well as information. So that's why you can get co conflicting things going on there. But among boys, there's a lot of encouragement uh, among boys for sexual activity because of the, uh, the status 
that goes with it, the bravado, the pressure on pursuing it, and obviously the stigma of being a virgin, particularly as a as a uh, younger male. Those those are a little bit different with respect to uh, uh, the sexual activity. There is evidence of teens that are delaying initial intercourse experience, table 6.1. Social scientists study what might be going on there. There could be risks that are getting more attention, so we want to avoid the risk. There might be trends going on as far as uh, delaying that or maintaining virginity. So there's, there's lots of things that are going on at any given time that could be leading to a, a trend this way or that way. And the media has a, a growing influence, and we've already talked a little bit about social media because of all the information and, and misinformation that you can get off of social media. But it could be that the media influence is, is becoming more profound, and the book actually suggests that our media could be the primary sexuality educator of our youth because of all the exposure that young adults or well mostly teenagers yes and young, young adults too but the amount of exposure uh, through the media and social media as far as um, what not just what is cool but what is attractive and sexual sexuality things like that so the the more viewing that a teen does with these types of media that associates with earlier involvement in sexual activity. So there's a, a correlation there with the exposure to that type of media. And of course, social media is uh, not necessarily the same as a teenage magazine, but still getting a lot of influence there. And there have been some studies particularly as we become more open with our uh, you know, sexuality and talking about sexuality, the uh, sexually degrading lyrics in songs, those have been studied along with uh, potentially violent content in some of the entertainment media out there. So those things are studied. And I guess it's probably not a surprise that if, if a, a young person is listening to things that are talking about sexuality or even sexually degrading type things that that could lead to not to everyone obviously but to whoever might be kind of inclined toward that to think it's acceptable or be able to rationalize it being able to do that so these teen focused magazines and now we, we don't have as many hard copy magazines as we used to but you can still access a lot of these on uh, line, but uh, they they send out the mixed messages that uh, particularly when you look at the covers, you've always got attractive people on the covers, uh, somewhat sexually provocative. Girls are encouraged to be appealing to boys, while in many cases negatively portraying boys as inept or predators. Uh, so that could be uh, some of the mixed messages that are coming out. And of course, that leads to expectations. We've already touched on this a little bit with social media. The, the amount of anxiety, depression, even suicides among teenage, particularly among teenage girls, that has uh, risen quite significantly over the past uh, decade or so. And these types of uh, messages could be contributing to that. And then the uh, immersion into social media where you might be getting a lot of these types of messages. More on the media influence, that exposure to sexual content is a strong influence on teen activity. So that, not surprising, the young impressionable mind seeing this material might start justifying it themselves, rationalizing it, feeling that it's acceptable. The, uh, the adult-focused magazines may convey sexually aggressive women as positive and sex as less risky and more casual. So that those are some of the, the changing norms over time as uh, the openness about it increases, then it starts to becoming 
more of an acceptable behavior, but it also could be uh, downplaying some of the risks, making it more casual, when in the past it was, cons con it was kind of considered to be connected with the relationship, now could be potentially casual and disconnected. But there has been some change over the years uh, through the media that women are taking charge in the relationship, becoming more, perhaps in some cases, more aggressive or more uh, as the initiators and these types of things. And another thing that the social scientists have to deal with is that data on sex is fairly difficult because with polls, you might get a lot of uh, exaggeration, particularly amongst the, the male side. You might be getting a lot of exaggeration. You might be getting some understatement there because even in an anonymous poll, people might not be willing to be completely and totally honest in a survey that, that somebody is going to read and compile, even though they don't know who said what. So uh, the surveys do over time, as it becomes more accepting and open to talk about these things, they obviously have shown an acceptance of premarital sex and same sex activity. So that kind of is a, of a trend that we've already touched on. As far as in adolescence, this is where we see some pretty major challenges because you're going through that period where it's uh, becoming uh, more of a drive, more of a, in some cases, perhaps a pre preoccupation with this as you uh, get older and, and learn more about it and, and the, uh, the uh, hormones, I guess you could say, kick in, things like that. So there, the challenges, of course, again, I when I speak, it's no, mostly from the male, from the male point of view, other than what I've read from the female point of view. But uh, clearly, one of the challenges is is uh, integrating the the love and the sex, particularly from the male point of view. They are uh, quite separate very early on when you're being pressured to pursue this and. Uh, you know, kind of a rite of passage type of thing. And then as you get older, you start to realize, well, it needs to be kind of in conjunction with love. So those are some of the challenges that we still have of putting that intimacy and that commitment together. We've already talked about those are two of the, the major pillars of a successful, stable relationship is this form of intimacy, as well as the commitment to that person and that you're not being intimate with uh, somebody else. So that that's part of those, those uh, main pillars that we talked about in the previous chapter. And then of course, if you're going to engage in this activity, got to make decisions about birth control and what the risks could be if uh, someone gets pregnant and then has the child. We will we'll look a little bit more on uh, teen pregnancies, teenage divorce. We'll look at some of those things a little bit more. And then fairly early on, people start to realize what their sexual orientation is. There is a strong genetic component to that, even though we're seeing a lot of activity now, particularly amongst the Gen Z, the, the younger generation, because of a lot of the angst and anxiety and, and other challenges and a lot of the social media influence, there could be some contagion effect. Uh, might be a little bit stronger among girls than it is boys as far as experimenting with sexual orientation. So this is uh, another one that's, that's very uh, uh, interesting as far as how that's going to play out as far as, you know, the, how it's, it's really unlikely that the genetic component to sexual orientation would just change that quickly. So there's some other things going on in U.S. society that might be affecting that. But obviously very early on, if someone is inclined towards same-sex relationships, that starts to become a uh, challenge to deal with very early on. What what are these feelings? Am I, is What's going on here? Who, who can I talk to about this? And uh, is somebody going to be accepting or willing to listen to that? 
and then developing some sort of philosophy of uh, sexual activity or a framework of how a person is going to uh, deal with this. So those are the challenges that uh, adolescents are dealing with very early on. There, as I said, there is a changing tolerance towards sexual activity, and that includes amongst adolescent behavior, even though the, the risks and the uh, downsides are, are just the same as they've always been. The number of uh, 15 to 19 that have never married, 44% females, 47% males report at least one experience of sexual intercourse. So that's, you know, about half of that age group there. Three-fourths of those, it was with someone they were going steady with. So that's still a substantial majority that they are having that, that uh, experience with someone that they are dating. And then this is a little bit less, but one-fourth of 12th graders, seniors in high school, reported with four or more sexual occurrences with uh, another partner there. There could be a, a little bit of exaggeration going on there as well, but um, you, you have to look at uh, a lot of these polls over time to see what the, uh, the trends are. And then uh, an interesting trend that has come up with particularly our technological advances with our constant exposure to the communications technology and, and our phones, things like that, uh, a new word has popped up. Instead of texting, it's sexting. And there have been some, there, the book talks about a couple of case studies here where uh, people, young people, have been charged with uh, child pornography because of uh, what's going on with uh, some of this this type of communicating here. And there are some states that are pursuing changing their laws to, to not penalize a couple of teenagers that may be doing this and not, you know, making it a necessarily a criminal activity that could really uh, put somebody in, in a bad situation for the rest of their life. So they are, they are looking at, uh, this is what, uh, Society has to do when things change, we get new technology and then we start using and abusing that technology in a certain way. Then laws have to kind of go, wait a minute, that we got to change something here. Uh, so that's kind of how it works. Now, as far as unwanted or forced sex, the one in five women in this uh, fairly large age group right here, 18 to 44, report having been forced by male to have sexual intercourse. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that with um, uh, the sexual violence that uh, is, you know, perhaps a little bit more predominant uh, over time because of uh, more reporting of it, more, more complex society, more people out there. 10% uh, of high school females report that same thing. 70% of females amongst this age group, 18 to 24, report that when they were 14 or younger, the first time they had sexual intercourse, either they didn't want it to happen or had mixed feelings. So there's an, an element there of being pressured into it. And nearly half of those whose first time was at age 18 to 19 characterized the experience as something other than what they really wanted. So those are some of the the uh, kind of dynamics that are going on there, particularly between the male and female side, where the males are constantly pushed and pressured and, and perhaps even more genetically inclined to pursue the relationship. So that uh, is leading to some of these dynamics here that have become a little bit more well known over the years uh, with things like the Me Too movement, where these uh, adult males who are in charge of business operations and they've got females in their employ and then they're they're pressuring the females for sexual activity and that blew up yet again during the me too movement 
As far as virginity goes, there's a uh, sidebar in the book that talks about some of the, the recent trends on what it means to uh, losing the virginity. Over half of the 15 and 19s report never having had it. So that's uh, about 50% remaining virgin to that period. And obviously it's different, once again, between the male and the female as far as that goes. Women are more likely to worry about the negative outcomes of losing the virginity. And of course, in some societies, that's a big stigma to, uh, for women to be uh, sexually promiscuous before being uh, committed to marriage. Obviously, on the, on the male side, it's much different because there's a lot of peer pressure and stigma with being a virgin, that sort of thing. By the year 2000, the median age at uh, virginity loss uh, for age 16 to 17 was about the same for males and females. And so that, that tells you where the, uh, those dynamics kind of have to meet, right? Uh, even though you might have different directions going from the male-female side, uh, it kind of has to balance out overall. The biggest reasons, of course, for retaining virginity is that there may be some upbringing there against the religion, uh, morally not comfortable with it. And then having both parents, this is one of these things that we'll talk about more later on throughout the class, is that there, yes, there are advantages to having both parents. That doesn't mean that a child is going to grow up messed up or dysfunctional if they only had one parent. That's obviously been disproven big time. But having both parents, a, a male uh, a father figure and a female mother figure, those provide a little bit more, uh, I guess you could say, stability in general. Uh, so there are some benefits over time with having that. And there, what the correlation shows here with this particular study, and this, like I said, the, the book has lots of sources of studies that can be used to uh, for your own paper topic to look up some of these sources and go find those in the library databases and read those studies and see how they conducted that study, what those outcomes were. But uh, having both parents over time tend to associate with less experience, less sexual activity among females. As far as the uh, gay lesbian uh, identities, there, like I said, there has been the uh, growing acceptance of that behavior and there is a strong genetic component, as I said, unconscious formation of sexual orientation, the median age of that, to where it becomes pretty much obvious, even though it may be earlier that the inclinations are there, but median age of 12 to 13, so that's even before they're getting into their teenage years, that orientation is pretty much set. A you know, 2015 study showed that three-fifths of those surveyed said that it would not upset them to learn that their child was gay or lesbian. Now, three-fifths, again, that's uh, a majority, but it's still 60%, but that's still a lot more than it was as recently as the late 80s. So that is a pretty big change. For example, like this one right here, in 1985, 9 out of 10 said that they would be somewhat or very upset if they were to learn that. So you can see how norms shift and change over time. There's still some victims of discrimination and hate-motivated violence with the uh, gay-lesbian uh, lifestyle. 57% of sexual minorities experienced what they called heterosexist harassment. This might be somewhat similar to the, the bullying aspect of it with um, the, uh, the teenage activity. But as far as the prejudice in general, the older, more set in your ways that what you've been raised and what you've been socialized into, that prejudice is associated with that older, less educated, more religious or conservative mindsets. So not real surprising there that uh, these in some cases, as these norms shift, 
the older generations may not necessarily be accepting of them, but then as they move out of the picture and the new generations come up, then those norms start to become the, uh, the new way. Uh, legalization of same-sex marriage, as I mentioned before, that was a fairly rapid transition because as recently as 1995, Congress actually passed a bill, Defense of Marriage Act, that literally defined a marriage between a man and a woman. And that created some legal problems over the years. But uh, that changed fairly quickly. We'll probably look at that timeline here when we get a little bit more into that. Coming out is becoming a little bit more accepted to uh, not have to live in secrecy or hiding it. And so the, that has been somewhat of instrumental in trying to reject the stigma of being gay or lesbian. The median age of that is 20 years old, and that's probably could potentially get younger. Obviously, there's going to be some emotional distress with uh, revealing that. And the longer that someone denies their, their true uh, sexual or orientation, that, uh, that, you know, obviously later in life disclosures is uh, going to have to pretty much correlate with that. Majority report that it either improved or didn't change the relationship with parents. So that's another thing that parents over the years have uh, begun, begun to accept that it's possible that that could happen and you'd have to accept it and deal with it. So that's why relationships are in this probably will get higher as we go. Now, outing somebody being uh, gay or lesbian, the issue there is what's, what's the intent? Because you could be invading somebody's privacy by doing that. The activists might say that if, if you stay hidden and don't reveal it, then that's, that's uh, adding to the stigma because they would say, what are you ashamed of? So we're going to out you. And so that's a, a fairly controversial situation here that the activists that's trying to out people saying that uh, if we don't do that, the negative stereotypes would remain unchallenged. Obviously, then the other other person might say that, well, people still have the right to their own privacy and that's their own decision to whether or not they want to share that. Now, sexuality, of course, retains all the way through um, life. Uh, and as I've already talked about in long term relationships, the, the sexual intimacy uh, starts to shift more towards emotional intimacy so the uh, sex starts to get redefined in a way it's not the same passionate uh, uh, part of the relationship as it was early on so this is part of accepting that aging process as particularly as you get to middle age there's other things that that people are concerned with as far as men fearing the loss of uh, sexual capacity women fearing the loss of uh, attractiveness, the uh, menopause where the menstrual cycle ceases to uh, happen and that then that means the end of fertility. So that's a, a fairly major landmark life change there for women. That's uh, part of the normal process. Other things that could be remaining uh, stigmas is that uh, autoeroticism. This is uh, still somewhat stigmatized, condemned, promoting uh, negative inhibitory attitudes, as well as underreporting. The 60% uh, of females, 90% of males, that's a pretty significant difference, but not surprising that uh, as far as fantasies go, and not only that, the, the contents are different. Females uh, are fantasizing more about romantic settings and things like that, where ma males might be fantasizing about uh, other partners, multiple partners, things like that. So there are some interesting differences as far as uh, how that uh, how those fantasies go. As far as masturbation, well over 90% of uh, men report 
having done it, uh, in other words, pretty much all of them, uh, considerably more than women. So that probably tells you a little bit more about the uh, inherent sexual drive between the sexes as well. As far as interpersonal progression of the, the sexual activity, there's that milestone, of course, as uh, getting into adolescence of that first kiss. The touching and the kissing becomes increasingly important with the aging process and the long-term intimacy of that process. We already talked about that as far as sexual uh, intimacy, and then that could also be uh, defined as just uh, personal intimacy, very uh, intimate or, excuse me, uh, subtle type things going on there that uh, are important to a relationship. There's a considerable variation as far as uh, the, uh, the experiences by, by age group. Uh, clearly, the, uh, it peaks at a certain point and then declines with age. That's on table 6.4, where you can see the breakdown by age groups as far as uh, sexual activity goes. As far as non-marital sexual, sexual activity, there is an increasing tolerance to uh, premarital sex that we've already talked about. 90% of never marrieds between this age group, 15 to 44, have had intercourse before marriage. And this long-term commitment is less of a prerequisite for sex as it might have been early or uh, a couple of generations ago that uh, more acceptance of that activity, not needing the, the commitment in order to engage in that. At least 10% of Americans will never marry, and it's possible that that number could be ticking higher. But one of the reasons why is that there's more cohabitating. So if more people cohabitate and decide that that's acceptable and they don't need to get married, then that number could tick up as far as uh, never married. And the uh, but there's still lots of things out there. The, we'll, we'll talk about some of the, uh, the, the risks involved, but there's increased need for safe sex, birth control, the, uh, having children, communications required to, uh, to monitor that activity, not just with parents, but with between uh, the couples there. The extramarital sex does remain negative. That's one of the strong norms in society is uh, monogamy, sexual monogamy. The 90% say that it's always or almost always wrong to have sex outside of the marriage. So that, you know, once people make that commitment to marriage, that uh, sexual monogamy is a, still a very strong norm in uh, American society in particular. Men, uh, again, we've already talked about some of these differences of what men are driven towards, and men are more likely to pursue the extramarital sex for sexual excitement. Women, less likely to pursue it, but when they do, it's more for emotional fulfillment. So we're talking about fairly broad generalities here as far as the difference between the sexes that we've touched on several times before. So these are the fairly large general differences as to why men might do this or women might do that. As far as sexuality within the marital bounds, as I said, that diminishes over time with the length of the marriage, the habituation that uh, tends to uh, dampen the uh, drive that uh, started it in the first place, that starts to dampen. So though those things are replaced by other things such as commitment and other types of uh, intimacy because being accustomed to your partner that uh, kind of, like I said, dampens the, uh, the sexual excitement. The, uh, the children, lack of privacy, those are some other things that are involved in uh, lessening that activity. Time management because everybody gets more busy, more tired at the end of the day, more social pressures on each of the partners that uh, take their mind off of uh, the sexual intimacy and more activities, more interests going on to fill in the gaps for that. As I said, monogamy is still the norm in uh, 
in society, no matter how much more acceptance we have and how norms have shifted and adapted over time, monogamy is still considered the, the basic norm. Marriage is still considered somewhat of the gold standard of the most uh, ideal end uh, goal for relationships. Marriage still is considered to be more socially desirable for children. That could be uh, shifting and changing. There are 40% of births to unmarried women. So that shows that that number is increasing. The passion of romantic love, as I said on that previous chapter, with a long-term, successful, stable relationship, the romantic love starts to shift more to a form of intimacy, caring, commitment, those major foundations. Now, there are several se sexual dysfunctions that the book talks about. They uh, could be low or inhibited sexual desire, conflict within the self or within a particular relationship, health issues that could be affecting the sexual intimacy, arousal difficulties, painful intercourse. Obviously, the older you get, the more potential factors there could be going on there as far as health issues, diabetes, and depression are also factors with respect to uh, sexual uh, intimacy and performance, performance anxiety. Those are things that men may have to deal with as far as performance, women with orgasms. Those are some of the uh, issues that, are, that affect sexual behavior. Obviously, disappointment, anger, hostility could ar arrive from some of those dysfunctional behaviors as well. And of course, then there's the sexually transmitted uh, diseases there, sexually transmitted infections. There's 20 million new cases per year. There has been an uptick on uh, things such as uh, syphilis. So the, there as trends shift and change, it may be less emphasis put on safe sex and protection, things like that. So then you start to see a spike. Half of the, the infections are among the 15 to 24s, the ones that are most sexually active, which uh, not surprising there, but they also might be less likely to use protection. Table 6.6 .6 in the book gives you the breakdown on the principal uh, sexually transmitted diseases. As far as HIV AIDS, the, the big era of the, through the 1980s and the 1990s where there was a large death toll, they were able to, to get uh, the virus under control as far as people being able to live with it through medication. 60 million around the world have had the virus, and there's 20 million AIDS-related deaths since the early 1980s. And as I said, with the, the cocktail of drugs and the, the new medications that are out there, 34 million currently living with the virus, but there still are 50,000 new HIV infections in U.S. per year. So there are still some uh, concerns and challenges with that. And then the male sex with other males, they account still larger amount, two-thirds of all new infections. And since the beginning of the epidemic, 118,000 women have died from AIDS in the U.S., out of 700,000 total. So that shows you how much more that was so heavily weighted towards the, uh, the male homosexual community there. But, uh, you know, no cure for it yet, but uh, considerable medical gains have been made. Advances in treatment, as I said, have reduced the mortality rates. The, it's becoming more routine, rapid testing involved person may be HIV a positive for years before developing any AIDS symptoms. But there is a definable progression. And clearly, if anybody is uh, in, in that lifestyle or prone to those, they would probably uh, be more sensitive to those and would be more motivated to keep track of what, uh, what those are, keep an eye on it those with HIV, HIV are carriers, regardless of the symptoms that they may be showing, or even the lack of symptoms that there may be, could, are still potential carriers. 
And with this type of uh, virus, it's transmitted only in a certain under certain defined circumstances with respect to sexual behavior. Or again, one of the other factors was the uh, the uh, needles, the sharing of needles. But no group is immune from the possibility of infection. So that's why you know the uh, the awareness and the advocacy to uh, keep keep up to date on that is still important. As far as the protection and responsibility with respect to sexuality goes, abstinences, abstinence is one of the, particularly from the conservative side of things, that uh, the best remedy is just not to do it. That's obviously a, a very tall order, particularly amongst adolescents that are very much driven towards doing it. But uh, transmission through intravenous drug uh, the shared needles, I've already talked about that. More use of condoms is also shown to be effective. Disclosure of intentions in, in, as far as infections go, that's always kind of uh, part of the responsibility. Mutual agreement before any of these activities are engaged in. But the safer sex practices that we've already talked about. And of course, if you engage in something that could be potentially risky, then you have to be aware of what the consequences are and be willing to accept those consequences as a result. And that's something that's obviously very hard for potentially an adolescence to do when their hor hormones are ranging and they're, uh, they're not really thinking about those consequences. All right, so that concludes the, uh, the chapter on sexuality in the marriage and family course.